Okay, uh, ladies and gents, welcome to the first topic, topic 1.1, 1 .1, uh, known as the purpose and nature of businesses. Now, before we carry on uh, with the this uh, lesson, uh, I'm going to talk to you about these tasks here. So whenever you see the, the words do now, keywords, book, uh, what uh, I'd like you to do is basically write down these key terms. Uh, now, if you're in my lesson, uh, you will have been given a small blue book, and that's going to form... Um, turn into your dictionary or key terms book. Now, if you're not in my class, in my lesson, and you're watching this online, I would suggest you just get yourself a small um, notebook, nothing fancy uh, needed, just uh, something to write in, and this will be you creating your dictionary as you go through this course. So, let's continue. First four words of this lesson we're going to be looking at, and some of these you may already be aware of, and some uh, you may not, but we need to have the the official terms, the sorry, the official definitions down, um, just to make sure that we actually have the, the right understanding of these words. So number one, goods. A physical product such as a car, a service, an intangible product, which basically means you can't touch it. It's not something physical. And this could include things like financial advice, a bus journey. Um, dentist appointment, um, you go to the doctors, you know, you are given a service. It's not something you can physically take away with you. Now you might say, but you can get the prescription and you can go and get the medicine separately, that's fine. But what the doctor does for you is a service. So the goods are anything physical and the service is anything that's not physical. Both things can be sold um, and you can get both of them um, from the same company. And they do often go hand in hand so you can purchase a product which is a good and then there might be an aftercare service the way they deal and take care of you after you've left the shop now we've got two other words customers and consumers now the customer is whoever purchases a product so the person who actually paid for it a consumer is a person or people who then go on to use it now it can be the same person so for example i might buy a car and that it might be for myself, so therefore I am both the customer and the consumer. However, I might treat my brothers and my sisters one night and go uh, to the local takeaway and buy, uh, you know, a couple of bags of food, pizzas, burgers, and so on and so forth, fries, drinks. So I'm the customer. I'm the one who went and paid for it, but I'm not going to eat at all. I mean, I could try, but it, I know it won't go down well for me. So it's not just for me. So I'm bringing it back home and I'm feeding the family. So therefore, the consumer is both myself as well as the people who are there as my guests, i.e. My, my, my parents, my brothers, my sisters. So you can see there's a distinction there. And if you need a bit more longer to copy these down, just pause the video here and um, continue when you're ready. Okay, so learning objectives. In my lessons, I tend to have um, opportunities for the students to read. So obviously it says read to us here. Obviously, since I'm making these videos online, we don't have to have any kind of reading. Uh, I'm going to read it out to you. You'll be listening. You'll be making notes. Um, so let's go through this. This particular topic is going to last about four or five lessons. Um, and it's all about why companies exist in the first place what makes them want to be a business and it's all down to the people and there's many reasons for that so there are many different forms of businesses and many different reasons why businesses exist in this topic we're going to consider why people set up in business and the typical objectives that organizations have we will also examine the environment in which businesses operate and how this can affect their behavior so by the end of this topic, you, can, you should know the following. One, the purpose of the business. Two, the reasons for starting a business. Three, the business, so the basic functions and types of business. Number four, business enterprise and entrepreneurship. What do they mean? And number five, the dynamic nature of business. Now we're going to start off with a small video. Now this is a clip that I found on YouTube. I don't have any rights to this, so I'm not going to take any credit for it. Um, it's a short clip. What I want to do is basically, what, while you're watching this, I want to answer these three questions. Number one, what are the key ideas discussed in this video? Number two, what examples are discussed? And number three, explain one of those examples. Okay, so let's watch this video and uh, try and answer those while you're watching it. In order to understand 
understand what lean really is, it's important to truly understand the purpose of a business. So what is the purpose of your company? Let's think beyond just profit. What about the customer? What are the types of things your customers value? Safety, cost, quality, convenience, speed, or even innovation? Would your customer still purchase from you if you weren't focused on providing what they need? Let's use a common example we've all experienced, dining out. So what are the things that you look for when choosing a restaurant? If you're in a hurry or you're on a budget, you might choose to go with a fast food venue. But if you're also on a diet, you may choose a place with healthier options. And if you're really hungry, you might decide on one that serves larger portions. Or if you're looking for a nice night out, a good steak, and an excellent wine list, you're probably willing to pay quite a bit more than you would for a burger and fries on the run. You might even pay more if the location were convenient or for an atmosphere that sets a certain mood. Now, imagine that you arrived at your favorite lunch spot just to find out that they're out of your favorite menu item, or that there's a 30-minute wait, or that your meal comes with a soda and a side and a dessert that you don't even want, or that your food is cold when it arrives, or that it tastes bad or even causes you to be ill afterwards. With that being said, think about that question one more time. What is the purpose of your company? It should have something to do with providing value to your customers and keeping costs as low as possible. Okay, so what you will have seen there, boys and girls, is that um, most companies, and I don't care who it is, I will always say that the number one aim for a company will be to make money. Um, profit is the number one thing. It's the key thing. It's what keeps the business going. It's what everyone wants. Most people who start off a business, that's what they're looking for. Um, of course, there are other things that people are aiming to achieve um, and the priorities will change over time and we're going to have a separate topic just on objectives and aims and things like that. But in this video, as you will have noticed, hopefully if, you, know, uh, you, you, you will have picked out that there are other items as well. So customer service, for example, it's so important to that uh, to the customers that you serve them on time, that you speak to them in the right ma fashion and manner. There's after care, care you know, after sales care. Um, you know, if you're serving food, it, it, people have different tastes and different interests and different uh, priorities. You know, some people do actually, especially nowadays, people care about being healthy. So if the food that you serve is not enough to say it's it's nice and it tastes good, is it healthy? And, and and the list goes on. So there are different reasons for having a business. People have businesses. Yes, number one to make money to make a profit. Even charities need money to succeed and you know to to survive to stay afloat and to actually uh, do what it is that they're trying to do, which is obviously uh, provide for a certain cause, help the poor, the needy, whatever it might be, uh, work towards a, a cure for a disease. Um, but money obviously is very very important. But it's not the only thing. Sometimes a business may start because they've seen a niche, a gap in the market. Sometimes a business starts because um, there may be uh, a problem they're trying to resolve. Maybe there's a product that uh, isn't doing the job properly. Maybe there's an ethical issue. Maybe there's uh, a problem uh, in terms of uh, technology, a certain type of technology not existing. And the list can go on and on and on. So hopefully that's given you a quick intro into uh, the purpose of a business. We're now going to go on to uh, this book. Now, most of what I'm going to talk to you about in most of these lessons, especially uh, what I'm planning to gear towards year 9 and year 10, most of year 10, is going to be based around this book here. So if you don't have a copy of this, I would highly recommend you go online and uh, purchase this book. It's from Harder Education and it's called the AQA GCSE Brackets 9 to 1. Uh, second edition business. It is uh, AQA approved and it's basically got everything you need um, for this, these, well, these exams, the two exams that you'll be doing in two or three years time. Um, so we're going to look at page two to four and what I would suggest is that 
um, underneath these subtitles or these headings that I have in front of you right now, uh, this topic being the purpose and nature of business, we're going to break it down. I'm not going to read through every single part of this book purely because it'll make the video far too long and hopefully you'll have a copy of this anyway. What I'm going to do instead is highlight or pick out some of the more important parts and elaborate on them, make it a bit more easy for you to understand. So why, whenever you see these purple slides and we're talking about popcorn reading, in my lessons what I tend to do is ask my students to go around and I randomly get uh, an individual to read and then I'll tell them to stop and they'll pick someone else out. Now obviously if you're watching this from home, whether you're in my lessons or not, whether you're trying to catch up uh, a lesson that you missed or whether it's because you're trying to get ahead or whether it's because you're from a different school entirely, it doesn't really matter. You'll be watching these and just be making notes. So I'll give you the basic understanding after each subheading. Uh, so let's start with the first one. So we're on page two if you have the book and we're going to look at the purpose of business. A business is an organisation that produces goods and uh, or supplies a service. A good is a physical product such as a car and a service is an intangible item um, such as financial advice or a yoga lesson. A business involves people, sometimes one and sometimes thousands. And it aims, or they aim, to provide something that is demanded by others. Um, business provides, businesses, sorry, provide a range of products for customers. A customer is someone who buys a product, as mentioned earlier on. Products are then used by or consumed by consumers. For example, if you buy a mobile phone yourself, you are the customer and the consumer. If your parents buy it for you, they are the customer and you are the consumer. A business is successful if it can meet the needs and wants of customers effectively. And need, boys and girls, is a basic human requirement. It's what we need, it's what, we're, what we can't live without, uh, what we must do. So, for example, we need to eat and drink. A want, therefore, sorry, on the, in the other hand, is a desire for a particular product. We need to drink, as I, as I mentioned, but we don't have to have say Coca-Cola or Pepsi, that would be something we want. We can survive of drinking water. We need to get from A to B, but we don't need to drive a car to do that or take the bus or take a taxi. We can walk. So reasons for starting a business. So we're now on page three. People start for many reasons. We meant we just touched on this on the sli in the last slide. Um, but the list can go on and sometimes there's a combination of them. Sometimes it's not just a one thing. Of course, there might be certain, certain circumstances or situations or individuals where it'll be one thing that, you know, sparks that, uh, that inspiration, that, that, that need or that drive and, and, and make, you know, pushes someone down this journey of having their own business. And other times there'll be other factors, there'll be multiple reasons for that. People who start up their businesses are called entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are willing to take risks to set up their own uh, business. They see an opportunity and have the determination, the motivation and the focus to start their own business rather than working for someone else. The ability to be an entrepreneur, that means to take risks and to develop a business idea, is known as an entrepreneurship. Sorry, entrepreneurship. So to be an entrepreneur means you have to take risks. You see something, you know there are risks there, but you're willing to take those risks because you, you, you think that it'll be worth it at the end or that it, the, the, the benefits outweigh the risk or that you think you can make, you believe that you can make something out of this. So what are the objectives of entrepreneurs? There are many reasons why people want to be an entrepreneur, as I mentioned. Some people want to be their own boss because then they can make their own decisions. They can decide when to start, when to finish, when to open up shop, when to close. They don't have anyone breathing down their necks. They may want to start a business because they want to keep all the profits. Like if you're working for someone else, you don't keep all the profits. You're helping someone else, a business to make money by serving customers and so on and so forth. But they give you a salary, a wage. You don't keep all the profits. Whereas if you own the business, then you do. You can after obviously paying for costs. Sometimes people start off a business because they don't have a job. They're not, they can't find a job anywhere else. They're struggling. So instead of, you know, working for someone else, they just end up making their own business. They own, you know, start their own company. Sometimes it's all based around an interest or a hobby. Sometimes it's all about proving someone or themselves something by showing that they can start a business for themselves. This may give them a sense of satisfaction. Other times they want to 
um, they want to, you know, fill a gap in the market, as I mentioned earlier on. It's thought they spotted an opportunity. Maybe they're unhappy with where they're working right now. Maybe that's because of the working habits or the working uh, conditions. It could be about the timing. Some people start off their own business because they're thinking about the, the fact that, you know, they have kids and they want to drop them off and pick them up. So, you know, they can't do that sometimes working for someone else. But if it's their own business, they're the boss. They can decide when to start and finish. Sometimes it's because they want to provide a service. They see that uh, certain companies are not doing something the way they believe it should be done or they believe that some companies in an industry aren't serving the customers the way they should be. So they're going out to create another business in the same industry to show others how it should be done by providing the services the way it should be provided. Setting up in businesses, sorry, setting up in business creates many exciting opportunities for people. They can make their own decisions and create something new. If the business is successful, there is likely to be a sense of personal achievement. Establishing a business gives people an opportunity to show their skills and possibly make more money than they could have by working for someone else. On to page four, we're going to look at factors of production. Now, there are four factors, four things that will um, determine how you can produce something. As a business, you need these four things. You need land, which is a physical land where you know that you could own or rent or hire or lease. This is where your site is, the factory or the, the your shop. And other natural resources that you may have. So, you know, there might be companies that deal with oil. So the land that they own uh, determines, you know, where the oil comes from. You need labour. Labour, boys and girls, is the skills and the number of people that you have. It's the people who work for you. How many do you have? Um, how skilled are they? Are they experienced? What kind of qualifications do they have? Are they the right people? Capital. Um, this could include the equipment used to provide the goods or services, such as machinery and equipment. And enterprise. Now, this is all around the skills of the people involved in the business to identify business opportunities and bring together resources to meet these opportunities. What a business is able to produce will depend on the quantity and quality of its resources and the way in which these resources are combined and managed. We're now going to be looking at opportunity cost. Now, this can be a little confusing, so bear with me. Opportunity cost is a sacrifice that you are you stand to make whenever you decide to do something. So if you have um, a decision to make, there's always something else that you have to usually have to give up or leave or not do as a result. So as an example... Imagine if you were um, at home and you've got an assignment to do. Maybe it's a piece of coursework. Maybe it's homework, and it's due the next day. And let's just imagine for a second. And I hope it's not you know this is not the case. But imagine for a second you're not very organised or you you've forgotten it slipped your mind or whatever it might be, and you left it last minute. So you got tonight to do it. But your friends are just uh, have just messaged you. And they want to hang out, they want to go out, they want to play something, go to the park, play football, maybe go out for a meal, go watch a film, whatever it is. Now you have a tough decision to make. Either you have option A, which is to basically say no to your friends and say, sorry guys, I've got to get this homework done um, because it's due tomorrow. The benefit of that option is that you don't get in trouble and you, you, know, you benefit from the learning that you that you hopefully achieve the knowledge that you gain from doing that piece of work. And as I said, you avoid the detention the next day. You stay in the good graces of your, you know, in the good books of your, of your teacher. You don't uh, get in trouble from your parents. You keep, you know, you, you make them proud. Um, but the opportunity cost there is, you know, what did you give up? Well, in this case, you've given up that night, that social time, that uh, the opportunity to have fun, to, you know, socialise and... Uh, be with your friends. Uh, maybe you lost out on watching that film, lost out on that meal. So the opportunity cost is what you gave up from doing what you decided to do. Now, similarly, you have the alternative. You could have said, actually, you know what? Forget the coursework or the homework. I'm going to go out with my mates um, and, you know, whatever happens, happens. You come back home, it's 12 o'clock, whatever it is, hopefully not that late. 
and you realise actually you can't do it now, you've got to go sleep and get up, get up early next day, so you haven't done your homework. So what did you gain from that? Well, with option B, what you gained was the fact that you that you got the opportunity to be and bond with your friends, to socialise, to have fun. You went out on that meal, so you didn't miss out on that. Uh, you got to see that film that you wanted to watch. But the opportunity cost is the fact that you are now in a position where you have to confront your teacher and say, sorry, I forgot, the, you know, I didn't get, the, get a chance to do the homework. You get a detention and you're letting your parents down. Not only that, you're falling behind your learning. So there's always something that you have to leave behind as a result of doing whatever it is that you're doing. Now, in the business sense, um, it's no different. You know, there is an opportunity cost in most decisions that a company have to make. We're now going to do the first case study. Now, these I really, really do like. And as I said, this is uh, from straight from the, the booklet. Um, so this is at the page of, uh, sorry, at the bottom of page four. And if you are doing this from home, and if you're in my lessons, please do not do not forget to copy the subtitle. So it's business insights, brackets, fat face. Okay, so in the exam, there will be questions and a lot of the high end, you know, top mark questions will be based around a case study. Sometimes it's based on a real life company and a real life scenario situation, and sometimes it's not, but that doesn't really matter. So these questions are, you know, it's well designed to emulate, to 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 feel and look like the real exam questions. So this will hopefully uh, prepare you well for the exams. So let's look at this case study, this this particular company. Fatface. Here's a description from the Fatface website of the company's approach and how it was founded. It was 1988, two young British guys were skiing in the French Alps, had an idea and started to talk. What if they started selling teas and sweats and make enough, made enough money to carry on skiing? And what if it, may, it was possible to live their dreams by setting up a small business with a big heart? Their favourite ski run was La Face in Val de Ciri, I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, a black run which inspired our company name Fat Face. Over 25 years later, we still love adventure, love life and have the same strong values. We still make clothes that reflect the, ha reflect the happy, healthy and active lifestyles of our customers. So what's the question? The founders of Fat Face set up a business because it was a hobby that they loved and wanted to pursue. Analyse two other reasons why people might set up a business. So six smart questions. So, question. so what I would suggest is that you pause the video here, give yourself about eight minutes, try to get some context here. Now the context means you're trying to answer the question without being too generic, without being too general. So your answer can't be something, even if it sounds impressive and you get the right terminology in there, your answer cannot be just something that you can swap the name, Fat Face for example, and put something like Tesco and still make sense. It should be specific to, the, to this company in this scenario. So what I always recommend my students doing is always pick out things from the case study that you can take and actually apply into your questions. There's an uh, answer, sorry. There's always some uh, some clues um, and some, you know, some facts or, or, or interesting points that is there for a reason. It's not an accident. They want you to understand this part of their story, this part of this, of this company for a reason. So you're going to extract whatever you need from this case study into your answers. Okay. Now on the next slide, once you've had a you know a few minutes to actually attempt this, we will go through some of the uh, the model answers given uh, by the exam. Uh, sorry, by by this uh, by the people who created this uh, question and what would be expected in the exam. So pause the video here. Give yourself about eight minutes, and I'll see you in a few seconds. Okay, so hopefully uh, you will have paused it and you've given it a go and you're back here now. And if so, let's have a look at what uh, some of the model answers could be. Now, this isn't an exclusive answer. It's not the, well, by that I mean it's not the only answer. There are many other ways you can answer this, but these are some of the things that you should be thinking about. And what I would like you to do is, I've got green ink here, green font, for a reason. So basically, anytime you attempt something yourself, you're going to then develop your answers and add to it 
uh, with anything extra that you might see uh, given to you by me here. So you'll see that this is what they would have liked to see from you. An entrepreneur may set up a business to pursue a hobby or interest. So for example, a person with an interest in painting landscape, uh, sorry, painting landscape pictures may decide to stop working and establish a business producing landscapes customers orders. In this way, they turn an interest into a business. Okay, so that's one reason why um, someone could do it. A lot of photographers do this, um, caterers and, so, you know, the list can go on. So, you know, people, a lot of people, they go into the line of, you know, so a lot of people have this dream of having a business. But then the question is, what kind of business? So, you know, what, can, what can I do? Because there's thousands, millions of things that you can get into. And in most case scenario, you know, most cases, uh, and a lot of people will have said this, and you may maybe you've heard this before, but if you pick something that you enjoy and love, then you never have to work a day in your life because you're doing something you enjoy. You don't see it as work. So a hobby or interest is something you enjoy, something you have a passion for. So instead of waking up every morning thinking, oh, I have to go to work now, you're thinking, oh, yeah, I want to do this. I want to... Because you have a genuine passion for it. It's something you want to do. So there's turning this interest into a business, something that they enjoy doing and are actually going to get paid to do it. Someone may decide to start a business to help others in society. One example would be an entrepreneur who sets up a business to look after stray dogs and cats in their area. This may involve setting up kennels or cattery and providing a rescue service. So basically to help people. To make money, some entrepreneurs decide to try to develop an idea such as new products. Uh, as a new product, in order to make a profit. Some, for example, James Dyson, who developed Dyson's vacuum cleaners and other electrical products become very wealthy. Now notice here, guys, that in the last slide, you know, a few minutes before coming onto this uh, uh, section, I said, bring in context. Now, these are the answers from the people who wrote this book. And, you know, as, as good as these answers might be, I still think they could have been better, i.e. bring in context, because you know what? They haven't talked about fat face. But I just realized something. Did you need to? Just think about it for a second. Look at the question. Did you need to bring in fat face in this question? Did you need to bring in context in this question? The answer is no. And the clue is, the question itself says people, sorry, let me say that again. Analyze two re other reasons why people might set up a business. Okay, so if I said analyze two of the reasons why Fat Face or the owners of Fat Face could have or may have wanted to set up a business, then you would have had to bring in Fat Face. But in this question, because it says other reasons, two other reasons why people might set up a business, you could have talked about anyone. So these three answers would have been enough. Perfect. It's fine. So I take that back. It's, a, it's They are decent answers there because the question itself hasn't... Um, requested you as the, the person doing this paper, this, this question, uh, to bring in the context of fat base. So always, there's a lesson right there, boys and girls, always read the question properly. I can't tell you how many times in the past, time and time again, I've seen students write amazing answers, but it's nothing to do with the question that was asked of them. And as a result, they don't get any marks. And that's a shame because first of all, you know, they've basically spent you know, five, ten minutes writing something, and it, it was a complete waste. And secondly, you, you know that if I just spent a few seconds just to read the question and plan out what they were going to say and ask us, ask themselves again, okay, am I addressing the question here? What points is going to address this question before writing it down? They will have really done well. So keep that in mind. Now, I will say that uh, in the future, I'm not sure exactly when, I will make some videos on exam techniques and strategies um, and how to approach exam style questions. So don't worry too much about that. In the meantime, I will obviously address each question as I am doing right now to give you an outline as to how you should approach it, what kind of words the exam examiner should be looking for and how you uh, can get top marks. So right now, boys and girls, I pause the video, use green pen, Add to your answer. If you've got any of these points, fantastic, give yourself a tick. Now, how do you get the six marks? Well, it says analyze two other reasons. So even though there's three here, you could give two of these and the analysis then gives you another two marks for each one, giving you three for each paragraph. 
Okay, so pause the video here. Um, make any amendments that's required. Add to your answers if you have to, and if you don't, well done. And I'll see you in a few seconds. Okay, welcome back. We're going to go on to the next slide now. And we're back on the book. We're going to turn to page five. Now, we're going to look at entrepreneurs now. Now, we're going to look at what makes them entrepreneurs. And the word that we're looking at specifically are the characteristics of an entrepreneur. Now, in this book and an exam, it seems like all you need to know is, uh, are these four examples. Believe it or not, there's more than this, just this four. I'd say, I'd argue that this is probably the, the these are probably the four main things that uh, a person needs to be a, a decent or successful entrepreneur, but there are other characteristics as well. So first things first, I'll me, let me remind you boys and girls, make sure you copy that subtitle, and you're gonna summarize the points from page five. So like I said, I'm not gonna read through the entire thing. You should hopefully have a copy, if not, buy one, it's well worth your uh, money. It's, it's got everything you need for the next two to three years, so check it out. So, innovative. Innovative, to put simply, means that this person, this entrepreneur, is good at spotting something that's never been done before. A gap, an opportunity, something. Maybe they see a problem, maybe something that's not been done before, or maybe something that's not been done the right way. Um, so, it's something new. So, innovation, the word innovation means something that's never been done before, or in the, in the way you're thinking. So, something new, okay? Uh, I often always have, and my students will know this, and if you're watching this, boys and girls, you know, you might be having a little laugh here. And a lot of people think, people who know me, that I have a serious problem against Apple products. And the only thing is, personally, coming from a business mind, I, I like value for money. Now, don't get me wrong, Apple computers, Apple, uh, even Apple laptops are decent. But I can't respect Apple phones, you know. Even my friends and my my wife will know how much, how passionate I can get uh, about talking how bad Apple are in terms of what they create. Because if you look at it, spec, uh, the, what they provide every year, there's no real innovation. And don't get me wrong, when it first came out, they were innovative. When they first bought the first um, iPhone, the way they implemented the touchscreen touchscreen screen, the capacitive screen, was different. Now, they weren't the first ones to do a touchscreen phone, boys and girls. Believe it or not, there were other handsets before them, like Sony Ericsson and so on and so forth, that, that actually had handsets before them that were touchscreen. Um, but they, do, they weren't really implemented well. The technology wasn't great. So basically, you had to use it one finger at a time. So you're tapping it one at a time, which was really annoying because it was really, really slow. However... When Apple came up with their products, they they revolutionized it, this, this touchscreen device, this idea of a touchscreen device, because the technology behind it, which was patented, allowed for the user, people like you and me, to touch the screen with multiple gest gestures and, most, and type at it, you know, with, with multiple fingers, which allowed it to be a bit more productive when you were typing things up. So it made it, you know, all of a sudden, for the first time, more accessible. And therefore, it was worthwhile getting a touchscreen phone. So they weren't the first ones. But the way they did the touchscreen was new. And therefore, it was an innovation. And as a result, it made sense to have the internet on there. It made sense to bring out apps. You know, Again, they weren't the first ones to have, have apps on the phone. But because of the touchscreen device, notice how everything that com came from this um, really was all down to how one specific piece of technology uh, was created. It really shaped not just Apple iPhone products, but the entire mobile phone industry. And credit is due where it's deserved. You know, they did revolutionize uh, how phones are working now and how they look. Every single handset out there, every single manufacturer now have designs that are pretty much the same look and and, and, and um, uh, user interface and and you know working as how iPhones are now where they've gone wrong over the years I would my, in my personal opinion is they haven't brought anything new to the to the to the you know to their products uh, let me give you an example and if you follow any YouTuber online uh, any tech tech reviewers they'll tell tell you the same thing they've got the new iPhone 
uh, I think it's the RX XR, can't remember what it's called. But they call the screen the liquid display. Okay, now that's a branding thing, and, you know, and again, I'll say they're really good at this. They're good at marketing. They're really good at giving a name and really pushing out something to make it really, really cool or sound cool. So they're calling it this liquid display. But it's the same screen as a handset they create. They had, I think it was three or four years before that. I think it was the iPhone 6. They had a, an LCD screen and it's exactly the same technology. It's no better. So what are you paying for? You know, that handset is £700-ish, thereabouts. Now, if you wanted to get an Android handset for that amount of money, you can actually get something that's actually more powerful, faster, and gives you more for your money, with better camera specs and so on and so forth. So anyway, as you've probably seen, I've gone on off on a little rant here talking about Apple, and, you know, forgive me, boys and girls, I'll end up doing this from time to time. But to be honest, I think it's well, you know, it's, it's, it's worth it, it's beneficial for you, because this is the point, I'm driving this whole point uh, uh, home here with innovation. It has to be new. If it's not new, it's not innovative. So for you to be an entrepreneur, you're doing something new. You, you've seen it, you've spotted a spot, uh, an opportunity, a gap, and you think this is something new, it's never been done before. The next one, risk-taking, goes perfectly with innovation. Something new means it's never been done before, which means inherently there's going to be a certain level of risk. Because if you're a paranoid person, uh, some might say a pessimistic person, you might say, okay, you know, why hasn't it been done before? Is the reason for that because it can't be done or that there's too many risks? You know, maybe the safety issues or it's going to be too, too costly or, or maybe customers don't want it. Yeah, just because you can do something doesn't mean you need to or that you should because you need to see whether there's a demand there. So an entrepreneur will see risks. They're not idiots. They will know that there is a risk there because you can't be blind. You can't just jump into something without knowing what the risks are. An entrepreneur knows what the risks are. He or she will have will take calculated risks. They know what is there, the dangers, but they also see the opportunity, what they stand to gain from it, and they believe that the the outcome, the benefits, the potential benefits outweigh the risks and therefore they take it. The third one is hard working and being determined. I mean, that's obvious. You know, it, I'm sure the, you've, you know what these words mean. You have to put a lot of time and effort into it. You have to really be, you know, you have to have grit. You have to be really grueling and working and basically put a lot of you know blood sweat and tears into whatever project it, it is whether if it's a product or a the entire company you're starting it off if it's a startup company whatever it is you have to put that time and effort in if you give up and if you don't have that determination if you don't have you don't have that commitment you don't have that willingness to you know to pursue uh, and you give up after the first or second hurdle, then you're not hard working or determined enough. You have to have that self belief and confidence to actually push through and get it done. I'm gonna go before I go into organ being organized. I'm gonna talk to you about Dyson. Dyson is the perfect example of ha being hard working and determined. He came up with the first idea, the, the, the first the, the, the idea of a bagless vacuum cleaner. Now, if you don't know his story, check it out. Go to his website. Go to Dyson's website. And you'll see there's a story there. It's it's amazing. When he first came out. Um, he he came from a generation similar to me, um, where vacuum cleaners. When I was your age, teenager, you know, teenagers, a, a teenage age, or even younger, when I was about seven or eight, eight years old, the vacuum cleaner in my parents' house, the one that my mom and dad had, is what most people had, which is basically a vacuum cleaner that had a bag inside. It was a paper bag, so it would suck all the this you know debris, the dust, the dirt from the ground off your carpet into the machine and then pushed and you know into a, a paper bag now when you think about it you might think well that makes sense yeah that means you just get you know once you finish you switch the vacuum cleaner off and you open it up and you get the bag out and throw it out into the bin but the problem was that well there's a number of problems it was it would lose suction because the air would go into them and it wasn't something that would be breathable and therefore it wasn't that powerful it was incredibly noisy, uh, even more so than what Dyson vacuum cleaners are right now, believe it or not. And lastly, it was actually, ironically, more messy because when you open it up, you had all this dust flying to your face and often you'll get it onto the ground and then you have to vacuum it again. Now, notice I'm using the word vacuum because a lot of people used to, and some people might actually say, even I've seen you know younger 
people using the word hoover. And, you know, sometimes you will, you will have heard people say, have you hoovered your room? Or I have hoovered my room. Hoover's a company. It's actually a, a, one of the biggest, or used to be one of the biggest vacuum cleaners, vacuum cleaning uh, machine, what's the word I'm looking for? Manufacturers in the world. They were big. They were massive. They were the go-to company for vacuum cleaners. They were so big that people used changed the word vacuum to Hoover. So, so what happened to them? Well, to put simply, the story is that Dyson first approached these guys with this idea. You know, one day because he comes from a design background, and you know he had that light bulb eureka moment, and he thought, you know what? We shouldn't have a bag. We need to have a vacuum cleaner that doesn't have a bag, that doesn't lose suction, that's more powerful and therefore cleans better. He went with the idea to Hoover, proposed it, and they basically said no. They rejected him, laughed at him, whatever it is, and then he walked away. Now, in most cases, most people would have said, okay, you know what, it's not worth doing it, I can't do it, I haven't got the money, I haven't got the, 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 the labour, the research, the manpower, whatever it is, I can't do it. But did Dyson give up? No. What he did was he actually went through to a number of different companies, got rejected each time. He then took, a bit, I believe, he took a loan out. I might be wrong there, but he had to get money to invest into it, and he basically made his own prototypes. He made a first one, tested it, found a problem, fixed that problem, made another one, tested it, found another problem, fixed that problem, made another one, a third time, a fourth time, a fifth time, and I believe he went up to a thousand prototypes. He made a thousand different variety versions of the same product each time fixing the problem uh, that was highlighted in the previous version. Eventually, he got a, a working product he was happy with. He went to Japan and created this product over there, made some money, kept the royalties, came back over here, used that money, and formed Dyson, the company. And look where he is now. Now, the irony, first of all, is that many years later, Hoover, the company, then was taken to court by Dyson's company um, and he had to sue them because they tried to steal his idea uh, after rejecting him many, many years ago. And to think if they had just accepted and believed and saw this innovation, this, this opportunity, the way Dyson saw it, they would have had, you know, they would be um, the, the top dogs in the, in the industry. They, was, they would still keep that name. Uh, unfortunately, it's Dyson who's leading the way for vacuum cleaners. But what does that story tell you? Hard working. You have to be hard working and you have to be determined. You can't just give up after the first solid hurdle. Most, if not all, entrepreneurs have that in common. The last one, being organised. Very easy one. You have to know what you need to do, when you need to do it by, and you need to plan things out. And that doesn't mean you have to have a plan and then you have to stick to it. Of course, you can adapt. You'll have to change things as you go along. But that is very important as well. Now, Hopefully you've been making notes as I was going through these. You need to have these four written down. You will be expected to know these in the exam. Right, study tip. In order to decide whether or not a business is successful, it is always important to know why someone starts up the business in the first place. If the original aim of the organisation was to help others, then even if it does not make profit, it, it may still be a success. So... It's not all about money. This is perfect for you know not-for-profit organisations, uh, social enterprises, charities, basically. Uh, because to see whether someone's been successful, you have to ask yourself, what do they want to do in the first place? Now, if, if what they said um, was, or if the, what they wanted to do was have five stores by the end of um, the first 12 months, and they got five stores but not making any money, then they've hit, they were successful because that's what they aimed to do. Uh, obviously, it's not realistic to believe that most people say they're going to want to make money as well, uh, make some profits. But a lot of companies in the first year do struggle, and surviving is more, you know, um, more of a priority than making uh, profit. But as I said, we're going to have a different topic about aims and objectives later on. Okay, we're going to finish off here, boys and girls. This brings us to the last uh, part of this lesson. Here's a little, it's a bit of a test really to see. Without looking back at you, not know, notes, looking back at this video, what I want to do is. Uh, uh, using this sentence starter, especially if you're in my lessons, uh, boys and girls, I want you to use a sentence starter. But if you don't, if you're not in my lessons, you don't have to. If you don't want to, uh, but what I'd like to do, what I'd like to do is use a sentence starter and tell me five things that you've learned from this session, from this, uh, from this lesson, uh, from this uh, uh, um, video. 
So five things, it could be anything at all um, from this video and we're going to finish off here.